Elise Byung, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I lost a friend to suicide on October 1st, 2019, and it was someone that no one would ever suspect. You had such a bright future and you took your own life. And that was so scary to me because in gymnastics, like it was normalized to be like driving to practice and being like, hmm, what if someone hit you with your car right now? Like it was bad for a long time. What in the world was all of this for? I put every ounce of energy into this. I did everything I could and it just wasn't enough. My best was just not good enough. How am I gonna be a leader if I can't even do gymnastics? You can still be a leader. You can use your voice. You can be there for your teammates. I'm in CalSAC, Pac-12 Salt, and Division One SAC and finally started Peer to Peer. It is 100% a safe space and you just share like how you're doing, good or bad. We're just all there to support each other. One of the too. few times I've done like uh, a podcast with somebody I know. Um, Your best friend? With my best friend, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Such great questions, fair. Today's guest is the great Elise Bion. As we joke around on the podcast in this episode, Elise is my best friend. Um, and it was very refreshing to have her on as a guest because usually all of the guests that I have on It's the first time I'm meeting them, which is a very unique experience But this was very refreshing because it's somebody that I already knew somebody that I talked to every single day um, So it was a very unique and special episode Elise's work is absolutely incredible. Yes, her injuries have limited her athletic participation here at Cal as a D1 gymnast But with that being said the work she's been been doing with Cal SAC Pac-12 uh, Pac SALT and D1 SAC is absolutely incredible. Uh, SAC stands for Student Athlete Advisory Committee, which is basically like the student government for student athletes at every single campus. She's deeply involved here at Cal, but on top of that, she's also the Cal representative at Pac-12 SALT, which is a student athlete leadership team. And on top of that, she is the rep for the entire student athlete body of the Pac-12 conference at the Division I level NCAA SAC. Um, which is absolutely incredible. I've gotten the opportunity to attend both Pac-12 Salt and D1 SAC as her substitute, and I am also involved in Cal SAC. So I really know the work that she's putting in, um, and I only got to experience a tiny portion of it, but truly the work she's doing is absolutely incredible and should not be um, overlooked. Um, so with that being said, with that context being said, um, I would like to remind everyone that there is a trigger warning on this episode. We do discuss suicide and just a heads up for anybody that would be listening to this episode. Um, and like I said in the announcement, I would highly encourage that if you need help, you reach out to the 988 hotline. It's besides that, it's honestly a beautiful story of taking an obstacle and just creating something out of nothing, how she used her mental health journey uh, to inspire others to live a better life. And it's something that she does by leading by example, as well as by practicing what she preaches. So highly recommend this episode. I hope you enjoy it. And with that being said, let's get it started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Denting. I am your host, Fernando Andrade, and today I have a very, 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 very special guest here with me. Um, not only an amazing person, representative leader, but also one of my best friends. <laughs> I'll give you that. There we go. Um, Elise Bion, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Super excited about this. Um, we've been talking about this for a while. We have. So, um... Here we are. Here we are. And we're going to go through your story, but I'm also super excited to, to have this conversation and see where it goes because, I mean, for the, for context, for people watching or listening, like, we talk, what, every single day every at this single point? Every single day. Yeah. We're, like, so involved in the same projects pretty much that we talk so much, so excited to see where this conversation goes. But to start off, for those that may not know you, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So... My name is Elise Bion. I'm currently a junior on the women's gymnastics team. I'm a media studies major, and I'm originally from Los Altos, California, so still in the Bay Area, stayed close to home for college. Um, yeah, that's just a small part of me, but... Yeah, that definitely a lot of things to get into. I mean, obviously, we're going to get into the D1 SAC and Pac-12 SALT and, and all those things, And but I want to start off with, like, 
Los Altos and where you grew up and how you got into gymnastics. I know you got into gymnastics in second grade, right? Yes. All right. So how was that for you? Yeah. So I actually was born in Pasadena and I grew up doing cheerleading until second grade. And it was like not the type of competitive cheerleading. It was more so like on the sidelines of a football game, flag football game type cheerleading and then I moved up to Northern California and kind of got into competitive cheerleading and then didn't really enjoy that so my mom put me in gymnastics and I just absolutely fell in love with that sport but um in my early I guess gymnastics days I was still involved in like all the other sports you can ever imagine I probably did every single sport and I loved every single sport And then getting to about, like, fifth grade, I kind of had to choose between gymnastics and soccer. So, you know, I'm still a soccer girl at heart. I love love watching you guys. But, um, yeah, I chose gymnastics in the end and just absolutely fell deeper in love with the sport. What made you choose between those two? Like, how did you choose gymnastics over soccer? Um, I think from an early age, I can tell that um, I had more talent I would say for gymnastics and I can see myself going further with that sport and um, I just absolutely love my team and my coaches and the atmosphere that gymnastics had so kind of just lean towards more of that okay. direction interesting people that have been on your well especially like female athletes that mm-hmm. have been on your they had to decide at some point similar age but yeah. it was also with gymnastics funnily enough and I wow. think I think yeah I mean Bordis was the other gymnast that mm-hmm. said she had to choose between the two but um, it was mostly swimmers that like did gymnastics as well and they were like yeah well, I'm going with swimming <laughs> but um, that's interesting that you had to choose between soccer like I actually didn't know that yeah. at all what about the flag football thing like how does one become a cheerleader for flag football I could not tell you my brother played flag football so my parents must have found out through that but yeah it was just like you were cheering on the sidelines um it was really fun like that was when I first started getting into tumbling and all that but also like with the sideline cheerleading you're doing cheers and chants so I was like the smallest one but had the loudest voice so I think that was kind of like foreshadowing what would happen in my future which I think is super cool yeah yeah 100 percent and um let's see that was how gymnastics started and you said you fell in love with it how was that rise like taking it more seriously because I think it's something super unique about the gymnastics culture, especially at that age mm-hmm. growing up. Um, I know at some point you were training four to five hours a day, but when did that start? Yeah, definitely. So I started gymnastics in second or third grade. So what, like eight or nine years old, something nine or 10, something like yeah, that. Yeah. So a lot later than every other gymnast, if I'm being honest. So I got a late start. I started at gold star gymnastics it was a local gym where i lived um and it was very much so developing my love for gymnastics it wasn't that competitive unless you wanted it to be competitive um and i got like my basics down and everything and then my parents i think kind of saw that if i wanted to take it to the next level and go like compete in collegiate um gymnastics i did have to make a switch to a more competitive gym and that's when i moved to airborne gymnastics in santa clara so still still local but um that's when i started getting really into it and my coaches were much more intense the program was more intense and that's when i switched from maybe like three hour practices to four hour practices and then from there just kept going and more days a week five hour practices um more intense competitions that was a big one instead of just local meets I was now traveling um to different bigger meets and qualifiers and that was a big eye-opening thing for me because a bunch of the airborne girls did go to collegiate athletics and there's a huge wall in the gym of all the different universities and I remember my first tryout day just walking in there and seeing that and being like I want to be up there I want to be one of those girls and that was just super inspiring for me and what I wanted to do in the future for my career that's super interesting that you guys had that that wall with all that like I know again just to mention it but like guys like Bjorn and Reese have mentioned Mm -hmm. like the wall with the Olympians that Mm -hmm. have gone to Cal or things like that and I think I don't know it's interesting that you have that and that you still like look up to that because in soccer like I guess you know who goes to play college, who doesn't, but yeah. we don't necessarily have a wall. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What, what type of role does that play for you, like having someone to look up to, or at least in those times? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just like it f- puts it into like a real 
tangible thing. Like, when you see that wall, it's huge. You're on beam, and you're just, like, staring off into space, and you just, like, see it. And then girls on your team, like, commit when they're young, and now you're practicing with someone at that level. So you want to be like them. So you follow them. You, like, in practice, you try to keep up with them. Um, So it's just being around that culture and that pace is – it grooms you to be a collegiate gymnast from the start. Yeah. I mean – completely fast forwarding right but is is that something you still try to do today like for example for me it's like this phrase I heard once from like an NBA coach I think um but it was greatness inspires greatness mm-hmm. and that's just like how to keep it going and it has to do with that same wall at airborne has to do with the Olympians walls here um for me it's like literally this podcast right like I look at all the pictures with all the guests and it's like that's my wall yeah. in a sense do you have something like that today exactly um So a big part of my decision to come to Cal was the great academics, but also the great athletics. And when you, when I came the first day, I like saw everyone just do basics and I was like, oh my God, like this is just a whole different level. But when you surround yourself with people like that, like you said, like it's just absolutely inspiring and it just, it makes you want to step up on a different level. And I think that's just a great culture here at Cal in general, but also within our program. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a good segue because I saw with your recruiting videos that that was like a big role for you, like being a top 10 gym program and then Mm -hmm. the university, I mean, academics speak for itself. Um, But then you also mentioned that like what was different about Berkeley than any other school. Um, You, you, I wrote it down. It said like um, that you like how people are focused on like changing the world, that there's people that will like inspire you in that sense. And I think it's pretty funny because we think about it at that age, like with gymnastics, we Mm -hmm. think about it with soccer and it ends up being a completely different thing. But I think it's like a, huge driver and like you said playing in that role with your recruiting process um what was that like with the recruiting process I know obviously you went through injuries back Mm -hmm. then um and that you were a bit surprised especially with your class but but what was that like yeah so I I totally remember that question it came from it was like why would you why did you choose to stay in the bay area and like you're close to home and all that and being in the bay area from the start like growing up being in like the heart of Silicon Valley and you're surrounded by just so many innovative ideas and people, I felt like Cal was just very similar to that. Like we talk about it now that academic wise, Cal is like the Ivy League, but athletic wise, we're like the SEC. So you're absolutely pushed to your max in both situations. And we talked about this year um, in the class that we peer advise for, like um, handle hard better. And that has been stuck in my mind ever since I learned that phrase is you are absolutely pushed to your max here at Cal. And I don't know why, but I kind of knew that going into it. And just through the recruiting process, I was like, I need to push myself to the absolute limits. And Cal was that perfect fit for me because I knew academic wise, I would have to step up athletic wise. I would have to excel and push myself to that perfection that we're all striving for. Um, So I really felt that. Cal was that place for me being a gymnast and knowing that there's no such thing as pro gymnastics right Mm -hmm. like obviously collegiate gymnastics is a dream for all of you yeah but knowing that there's nothing after that what makes you aspire to push yourself to that level of of eliteness um at this age you know like I don't know if it makes sense but at least for soccer players like at least freshman year you come on in and you're aspiring to be a professional soccer player afterwards. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about pushing yourself to a certain level, knowing that your career is coming to an end. So yeah. why why choose to do that? Like, yeah. what, what pushed you to do that? Definitely. So on the other side of that, like, we coming into collegiate gymnastics, we know this is our last four years. So knowing that you will never do your sport again after four years is scary and crazy and, like, it's bittersweet. So every single day, you're kind of just, like, this might be the last day. This is getting to the last day. So it's kind of pushing yourself, like, how much better can I get? And our coach actually says, like, this is our pro gymnastics. This is our professional league. So how do you want to put yourself out there? How much better do you want to get? And that's just, like, a different mindset change, I think, especially for gymnasts. Yeah, that's that's a good way to to look at it. I was writing, like, one of the blogs the other day, and I was writing specifically about that, like, um, I don't remember if I said it out loud in the class. Mm-hmm. Um, for those that don't know, we teach a class together um, <laughs> for freshmen, a student-athlete seminar that I've mentioned before. But um, 
I wrote it in a blog and I mentioned it in class, but it's like this concept of like memento mori, like meditating on your mortality. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that like what I wrote down was like the closer you are to death, the more alive you feel. And it's not that you're literally going to die, right? But Mm -hmm. knowing that, hey, this could be one of the last practices, like you want to go all out. And it happened the same way like for us this past weekend with senior day, like knowing it's that type of game everybody right? just falls it's out. It's just like, so much emotion put into it, too. Yeah. Yeah, I was literally walking over um, with one of my housemates, and we were like, we don't care about the result. We're not thinking about our opponent. We're not thinking about their ranking. They're a very good team. They're mm-hmm. number five in the nation. They're our rivals. But we weren't even thinking about that. We were so focused on ourselves, and I I mean, the result didn't go our way, but I think it's one of the better games we've ever played. And we're, we were so happy afterwards, <laughs> you know, because of how we played, and it's interesting that you have that perspective from the start. Like, I've talked yeah. about this with other people, but hearing it come from you just saying, like, I really want to push myself with those four years left. Yeah. How is that mentality for you arising after the two injuries, though? Because obviously you've had injuries at Cal, but you had two ankle surgeries yeah. before even showing up at Cal. Yeah. So <laughs> where does that come from, and what was the attitude with that first injury or the first two injuries? Yeah, so that was, like, a crazy ride. I just, like, my first... I've, I've never been injured before that. Like, absolutely did not have a big injury. And then before our in-house meet, my freshman year, I was a freshman at the time, and that's, like, prime recruiting season. Freshman of high school. Freshman of high school. Oh. And Justin and Liz had talked to my coaches before, like, we want to see videos of Elise. So about, like, four weeks before, I was just absolutely sending videos to them. And by then, two girls, Andy and Gabby, had already committed for my year. And But, like, in eighth grade, they committed. So in freshman year, like, I felt behind. So I was pushing myself, pushing myself, and going into one of my passes, I felt like my ankle just, like, not snap, but, like, something was wrong. But I'd never been injured before, so I was like, it's fine. So continued throughout the week on this, like, fractured ankle at the time. And finally was like, okay, something's wrong. Went to the doctor. It was, like, a pretty big break. So they're like, okay, we'll just cast you up, whatever. And I was like, okay, sure. Two days in the cast, they call me back. They're like, actually, we're going to do surgery instead. So they cut off the cast. I get surgery. I have, like, two screws in my ankle. And I was like, okay, whatever. And my parents by then were like, do you want to quit? Because they they also have never deal with, like, injury like this. Um, and they didn't know how common it was in gymnastics. Uh, so they're like, do you want to quit? Like, should we try a different sport? And I'm like, no, like, I, st- I still absolutely love this sport. I want to try and come back from this. So with the support, like, so much support of my coaches and my teammates, like, I was able to come back. And my recruiting is also kind of weird because I had been out that entire freshman season Never have, like, competed a level 10 meet when you get recruited. And I remember my coach texted me. He was like, what are your thoughts about going to Cal? And I was like, yeah, that's, like, my dream school. He's like, okay, you're going to have a call with Justin tomorrow at, like, 8 p.m. after after practice. I was like, all right. So I, like, hop on the phone with Justin, and he's, like, just talking to me, regular questions back and forth. And he was like, okay, so, like, we'd love to offer you a, a spot. I was like, What? Like, I'd never competed. I just came back from, like, an injury, a big injury, and I was like, what is this? So committed, like, on the spot because this was my absolute dream school. Um, Thankfully, I had a pretty good season afterwards because of, like, they took a chance on you. Like, you need to prove yourself. So thankfully, I had a great season. Um, Qualified to nationals and within Region 1, Um, it is the most competitive region, arguably. So even if you just make nationals, that's a big step. I did pretty bad at nationals, but that's besides the point. Um, and then the following season kind of got injured again, but pushed the recovery and had to get surgery the following summer after nationals. But again, like Justin and Liz had complete faith and trust in me to come back from that. And by then I knew I couldn't come back from an injury like that. So the second surgery was, I wouldn't say a breeze, but I had a lot more confidence in my strength. What, was it the same injury twice? So? No, the first one was getting screws in my right ankle and my left one was um, like ligament and stuff reconstruction. Okay. Yeah. I, I was reading through some articles and it said in one of them that throughout the first injury, 
you like rekindled your love for the sport of gymnastics just yeah. not being in there and that what you learned from it was great right yeah what did you learn from the second one the second one wow that was a long time ago um I would say that just like trusting my body by then I was getting older so it was harder to come back faster but and like the timeline for this injury was a little different because it was ligaments and not bones where it's just like healed right away whatever so my coaches were trying to push me but I was like kind of scared so I would be like I I don't know if that's the right time yet and they had enough trust in me where like okay you know you know your body and you know what you're feeling so I I said like not to push right now and I think that was a good choice just because there wasn't any need to we were in off season and I was like if I'm thinking about the upcoming season I can't like pound my body into the ground right now and it did pay off in the end but kind of just trusting my body and what I feel I think was really important in that second injury yeah yeah and and obviously like it's something you still have to be doing today oh, yeah. right when <laughs> when was that second injury or the surgery in 2018 or 19 I'm pretty sure it was 2019 okay yeah and yeah yeah 19 May, May 2019 and then you still came back for nationals after that um so it was I actually got surgery like three days after nationals after that 2019 season yeah okay because I mean I did see like 2019 uneven bars region one champ which yeah. was pretty cool and then you did third in the all around and four which is awesome um and then you ended up coming to cal 2020 yes so you were covid i was a covid kid you were a covid kid a covid class um take me through that obviously like we were joking around we're good friends at this point like you go through calbears.com and it's no appearances no appearances mm-hmm. obviously they're not going to be talking about your injuries mm-hmm. take me through through that you want to know about, like, my my journey in Cal right now? Well, I mean, just the timeline on your yeah. injuries. Yeah. Okay. So, actually, the last meet of March 2020 season of my J.O. career, I, like, fell on beam and just absolutely smacked my hand on the beam. And they thought I broke my hand. It was, like, the size of a balloon. But it turned out to just be, like, a bone bruise. But I could not put pressure on it for, like, four months. It was a ridiculously long recovery for something that wasn't broken it was very frustrating and arguably like bars is my event um so I couldn't do bars even before like the shutdown so I was out of that had no upper body strength and then the shutdown happened and the most I've ever taken off of gymnastics is one week so let alone months was absolutely crazy but I think for a lot of me and my teammates, we took the time to actually, like, let ourselves heal and our bodies, like, recover. So I think my body also, like, went through puberty then. Like, it was just, like, so weird to not be training that hard every single day. Um, So entering Cal, we had to – I was, like, able to get back into the gym, so was able to get my skills back and stuff. Came to Cal, COVID testing everything, and then – we had a quarantine for a week. So again, a week off of gym before entering our collegiate like preseason. Come into preseason, absolutely, let's go. We were already late in the start compared to other teams. We came in late September, early October. So already half our preseason was gone. Um, so immediately knew that I was just not up to the standard of these other girls because in club gymnastics I was kind of known at peaking at the right time like the first couple meets I was like kind of feeling it out not great and then by states and regionals I had it locked in and I was able to just kind of clutch up and make it to nationals but collegiate athletics like gymnastics that's not how it works from the first weekend of January you have to be ready to go because that's when national qualifying scores start so that was just such a wake-up call I think for my entire like class but definitely for me I felt that and I felt that pressure so um if you look at my stats I don't have anything but even despite being injured honestly I don't think I would have been ready like truthfully just I was not ready but um it was different for college gymnastics because in club you compete every weekend even if you're not ready your coaches still put you in even for an event or two but for NCAAs that's not how that works so I wouldn't be competing and um I just would take the weekend off basically so I think a big part of that first injury of um 
that happened in, I believe, March of 2021, um, was training intensely during the week, take a weekend off. Intensely during the week, take the weekend off. So that up and down um, training, I think, kind of took my body for a spin. But yeah, March 2021, I had felt my Achilles being pretty tight. And I just never, I've never dealt with Achilles pain before. It's always been ankles. But yeah, I remember it was the first event on floor. I was doing some tumbling passes and I was like, okay, like it's feeling better. I'm like warmed up and then going into a double pike. So it's a backwards flipping and going into it, my initial punch, I felt like someone had shot me in the leg. It was, it was something. So like in the air, I'm just like, oh God. So I'm just like pulling for my life. And then I absolutely face it and like all the pain just rushing to my calf. And my trainer like runs over and she's like, where does it hurt? And I'm like, I literally go, I don't know. Cause it just like felt like it was everywhere. And she was like, is your, is it your knee? And I was like, definitely not. And I was like, I think it's my Achilles. So she like cuts off my ankle tape and I will never forget the look she had on her face. Like she didn't even have to say anything. And I just knew it was like my Achilles was gone. So that was a bummer. That was definitely like the most physical pain I've ever been in, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah, that was just kind of a surreal moment, if I'm being honest, because um, I've had other injuries. But this one was just such an in the moment, like you're done. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> See, there's many injuries in sports, but that one specifically is just. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about <laughs> like even just listening to it. And we even talk about it a lot. I've mm-hmm. seen the scars and it's like, oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. But um, yeah, that's crazy. And you mentioned when you weren't ready, you weren't really competing. Mm-hmm. It's during COVID. So you're not really seeing people. And then this happens. Yeah. What were, your, what were you feeling at that time? Um, so many different things. Like, I try to think back to it, and I'm, I'm glad. Like, I got really into journaling at that time because I was just, like, mentally so down. Like, if you think about it, like, you put your entire life for this moment. Like, my dream was to be a collegiate gymnast, and technically I am, but more than that, I wanted to compete. Like, that was my dream, and... Knowing that, one, I just wasn't prepared, and two, now I'm injured and with, like, a pretty big injury, it was just, it was really, really hard. And I 100% could not have gone through it without my teammates and, like, now, like, my best friends living, like, with the girls in my class, like, 100% could not have gone through it without them. And also, like, with COVID, it is, like, very, very isolating, and not being able to see our the rest of our team because they weren't in our cohort, it was hard to, like, build that connection. But still, like, going into the gym and, like, sitting there and cheering on and everything, like, everyone made me feel like I'm still a part of the team. And once I was able to, like, walk around in the boot and stuff, like, I was helping out with mats. And that's when I kind of figured out, like, Liz always says it, like, your role always will be changing, and different times you become a different person, and we need you for different things, and that's definitely what I learned freshman year, and coming from Airborne and my role there, like, I was very much one of the leaders on the team, and coming to Cal, I was the youngest, I was not the best, and now I was hurt, and I was like, how am I going to be a leader if I can't even do gymnastics? And that's when I definitely had to have a mindset change of you can still be a leader, you can use your voice, you can be there for your teammates. And that's kind of the new role I took of either being the loudest cheerer for our team or just moving the mats, making sure everyone's like ready to go for their turn is something that I had to learn. Yeah. So like what you're saying about roles is something I've had to deal with as well quite a bit. And like, how do you come to accept that? Because you mentioned your classmates and living with them so Mm -hmm. just to be clear with everything you were living with all or five of them um in the (laughs) dorms right yeah so because of covid they didn't want us um interacting with other people so usually we're in clark kerr and they're usually with one other teammate and two random people but clark kerr was closed so we were in unit two wada so we were in a three-bedroom double suite style apartment. So fully, like, kitchen, bathrooms, everything in this suite. All six of us 
in this suite. <laughs> it was it was it was a good time. No wonder you're that close. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no other way to to survive that. <laughs> so so you get past that, and like you said, you were a leader on your previous teams at Airborne. Yes. Um, and now you're the youngest. You can't really interact much, but you found belonging through your role. Yeah. I guess. How did you come to accept that? Obviously, there's no other option, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of different mentalities you could have to approach it. So why that one? Was there somebody that guided you or that gave you any mentorship, or did you just decide to do it yourself? Um, I think it was kind of more self-induced. I think from my previous injuries, like, I learned there really is not anything you can do. And um, learning it from my cl- club coach uh, coaches, like, controlling the controllables. And when I got hurt, how to go through surgery and all of that, um, there was really, like, absolutely nothing I can do. Like, recovery is slow, and I understood that, and especially... Um, with like a tendon, it's, it's, it takes time to recover and heal and build that, um, strength again. So kind of understanding and really being, um, realistic with myself being like, you will be in pain coming back from this. You will be out of this sport for a while, but further than that, like you, you have to learn how to adapt to this. And I, it goes definitely into the student athlete identity and what that means, but, that was a big part of me learning is who I am outside of the gym and that gymnast um, identity. Yeah, and obviously it's like a huge identity crisis, mm-hmm. I think, especially even after graduation, right? Like, Because yeah, there is no pro gymnastics. Yeah. Like, like your coach says, this is pro gymnastics right here, and that's going to be another identity crisis. But is that pretty much what kept you going, that identity of like, hey, I'm, I'm a gymnast, I have to keep pushing. Is that what made you accept the role in a way? Yeah, definitely. I would say that. And when does the second one come? Because isn't it pretty close? Yeah. (laughs) So um, after surgery in March, I took about nine months to recover-ish. But they always say, like, when doctors give you a timeline, it's, like, maybe, like, nine, six to nine months. But that's, like, regular people, six to nine months. Like, running that stuff in gymnastics is, like hard punching, flipping, pushing off. So I I knew that it was going to take longer, but throughout the entire process, so I guess I didn't really learn that much from the second surgery because I was in pain the majority of the time coming back, but I think I was kind of gaslighting myself into this is a bigger injury, you're going to hurt. So coming back, like my Achilles was always swollen and I kind of always swell a lot, but it was like very, very swollen. I was always in pain. It hurt to walk. Like never really came down from that, like, that pain. I don't remember a time where, like, it didn't hurt to walk, and I thought that was normal. That is not normal. So I was actually on anti-inflammatories going into December, and I was, like, feeling better, and then we had, like, this talk in the gym of um, the people who are injured, like, need to do more, and I was like, yeah, you're right, whatever. So... The next day at practice, I'm on tunnel track, like, the trampoline, just doing my basics, whatever. And I do, like, one of the most basic skills ever, round a flip-flop layout. So the same takeoff of the last time, but I'm on a, like, lighter surface. I felt better because I was on meds, so I was probably kind of into it. But, um, yeah, going into it, I, like, it didn't hurt that much, but, like, I felt something weird. So when I landed, I, like, sat down, and I kind of just, like kind of sat there and was like okay I don't really know what just happened I looked at Liz and she's like are you okay I was like did I hit like the no tumble zone like there's a part where you're not supposed to punch she goes no I was like do you think I hit something at the bottom of the tramp she goes no (laughs) it was like okay trainer like something's wrong so they kind of looked at my foot did the regular test of like squeezing your calf all that and like my foot was moving because I think I just had so much scar tissue left over um and it didn't hurt that bad. I can still walk. But then you just, like, see my foot and there's just a dent, like a divot in words. And my trainer was like, so that's new. I was like, okay. And then they send me to Haas to get, like, an ultrasound done. And they're like, okay, it's definitely partially torn. But they also thought I just tore through scar tissue. So they're like, okay, let's get an MRI. Like, two hours pass, and my foot is black and blue, and, like, the back of my Achilles is just absolutely bruised. 
So I'm still like, okay, I can walk and it doesn't hurt that bad. It's probably not torn. I was like, it's fine. Get the MRI. Still feeling fine. Like I'm not in any more pain. And then I get a call from my trainer and she was like, so like not the news that we wanted. Like it's torn. And I go, like, partially torn? She's like, no, it's, like, fully torn. So then I go to another doctor here at Cal, and they show me the MRI, and they're like, so that's the part where it's, like, torn. And I'm still, like, not believing it. I was like, there's no way this is fully torn again. Because realistically, if it's surgically repaired, it's stronger than your other one. And most likely you tear the other one if you have a sudden tear. But this was on my same foot, the one that... And it tore right under where it was repaired. So I was like, there's just no way. And they're like, okay, like, you're going to need surgery again. And I was like, okay, cool. So got surgery again, like, two or three days before Christmas. (laughs) Um, And that was brutal. Like, the recovery from that immediately after surgery. The first time, I don't like taking the meds they give me because it's, like, a little too strong. But... I, like, needed the meds this time because I was just, like, in so much pain. And I remember um, for the post-op when they take off, like, this, the cast or whatever, like, that was a traumatizing experience. Like, my first scar was this big, like, for reference. The second scar, I look like Harry Potter. It's, like, six inches, and it's, like, that. It's, like, a Harry yeah. Potter scar. Yeah. So when they took off my like, cast and I saw that, I was, like... What is this? I was like, did you guys, like, get creative on my foot? I was like, what's happening? Um, so that was that was scary, and I had a lot of doubt in myself. I felt I like I just so clearly remember seeing that scar and being like, how am I supposed to come back from this if I couldn't come back from a scar this big from the previous injury? And that was just so scary for me. I think that was one of the first times we ever talked, yeah. honestly, because I I remember, like, something about the first injury, but I mm-hmm. didn't really know. I don't know how we were getting to know each other then, but yeah. I saw that second, uh, I saw the story of the second surgery, and mm-hmm. I'm like, no, like, that sucks, and I was just like, hope you feel better. And then through other events, we got mm-hmm. to know each other later on, earlier this year. That's pretty yeah. crazy that, that it right? was that quick, um, but yeah, that's... I mean, I guess I've known you through that entire process yeah. up until that point, and it starts to, you know, like, things start to make sense for me, I guess, because it's not that I'm part of that story at all, but I've, like, walked that with you, like, parts yeah. of it, I yeah. guess. Um, so, like, gymnastics at that point is, like, nowhere near the future, I guess, yeah. like, first two seasons. And I remember, uh, this is how we met, actually. Um, I remember probably, like, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. but you're like, all right, if gymnastics is, like, nowhere to be seen, I'm going to focus on the student part. And and we both applied (laughs) to Haas. And we both got rejected from Haas, which I've talked about a lot on this podcast. And, hey, so be it. Mm -hmm. Um... I'm not. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. Um, but it's. I'll. I'll just say it's pretty funny it that both of us got rejected from Haas. That's. That's all I will say. That was a bonding moment for us. It really was. You know, if that's what it took for this friendship to so to it. start, then so be it. Thank you. Sh- yeah. Shout out Haas. Shout out. Um, but at, at that point, like gymnastics is not there. Yeah. Student wise, like you wanted to get into this school, you didn't. Yeah, so you can imagine my mental state in January, February. It was bad. Like November, yeah, November's when we apply, right? Yes. Yes. So November in general was bad for me. Like I had built up me wanting to get into Haas for as long as I can remember. Like my dad was. A business major at USC. My brother's a business major at USC. I've been surrounded by like finance and the business industry industry my entire life, and I was like, this is the path I want to go on. And absolutely no pressure from my parents, family, whatever. But I was like, this is this is what I want to do. And freshman year, I remember like everything I was doing was for Haas. Everything I put my energy into was for that application for Haas. And when November opened up, I don't remember a day I wasn't having, like, a mental breakdown because it just felt so much stress that I was putting on myself. Like, that was the first time 
I ever seeked therapy because I was like, this is not normal. And it was just like a bad month. I had not, I was like still coming back from injury. And I remember I was like writing those essays and I was like, like, I'm a candidate, like I am a strong candidate. And I feel like a lot of times, like people who are like successful, let's say like academically and athletically, they might not have those hardships. But I was like, no, I, I've overcome an injury. I've overcome, like, two injuries in club. Like, I have a story, and, like, I, this is this is possible for me. And then I got hurt again in December, and then fast forward to January, February. Like, that's when my recovery process was, I would say, the hardest. Like, it was just, it was just a lot, and it was painful. And then Haas' decisions come out, and I didn't get in. And I remember I was like, what in the world was all of this for? I was like, I put every ounce of energy into this. I did everything I could and it just wasn't enough. And that rejection was just so scary. Like my best was just not good enough. And I would think back to like, why did I get hurt then? Like that was part of my story and it didn't even help me in this environment and I was just it was just such a bad place for me and thankfully again like my parents were like you don't need that like that was just not your path and my best friend from home actually she was like I told her and she called me and she was like when have you ever taken the easy route she was like you committed to your dream school after having one of like arguably like your first surgery your first major injury and like you still did that and she was like no matter where you want to be like you will get there. It might just not be the conventional easier route, but you will get there and you have never chosen like the easy route. So why would you choose it now? And that like absolutely just pulled me out of my slump. I was like, you are so right. And then like my best friend, David, he was like, I've seen you come back from one Achilles injury and now you are enduring your second. Like there's no way that a Haas rejection is going to get you down. He's like, this is not going to be the one that gets you down. And just having that support and with people who really know me, like that was more than anything to get me, get me out of that slump. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's so funny, honestly, to think that that was this year. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, there's a TikTok trend right now as we're recording, it's November and there's a TikTok trend right now that says January me would never recognize November me. Like, think it's about that. True. Like, you saying all of that uh-huh. and realizing that this was only in the span of eleven months. Yeah, that's insane. I know. I know. Haas was February eighth. Okay. I know that. I know that date. <laughs> um, I know where I was. I, I know. I know that moment. But from February eighth to November sixteenth, like that much happened. Yeah, it's it's absolutely insane. It's insane. With, uh, I want to talk about a bit about this mental health. Obviously, mm-hmm. you're very involved in that. Um, I, I mean, I consider myself an advocate, but I think you're much more so than me. Um, what What did you do at that time? You said in November. Was that your first time, like, therapy ever in your life? Um, I've actually gone through, like, grief counseling for different reasons, but that was my first time seeking, like, actual therapy. Yeah. Okay. And what was that like for you or how quick did it change because you talk about it so openly like at least for me like I remember the first time I went that at least that I can remember it was Mm -hmm. like elementary school like fourth grade um then again a few years ago Mm -hmm. and I'm like super comfortable talking about it I'm very open about it because I don't think it's it's just normalized for me yeah um but for you with it being a year ago now I guess that you just started like was there ever, like, that stigma for you, or have you always just been open about it? Um, I would say there was a stigma more so, like, me to my parents. Like, I was just, like, not comfortable talking to them about, like, deep stuff like that. But I had, like, my first panic attack freshman year of high school. Like, uh, yeah, freshman year in high school. I remember waking up, and this is, like gymnastics from the early age like we all joke like we have a lot of like trauma like just like the intensity of the sport like I remember waking up for school one day and just like absolutely having a panic attack because I was thinking about a release move that I would have to do later in the day on bars and 
my mom was like, you need to go to school. Like, what's happening? I was like, I, I cannot. I was like hyperventilating. She's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I just like, I can't, I can't, I can't. I was able to like pull myself together and my mom was like, okay, you need to like talk to your coach. Like this is not normal. And I was like, yeah, you're right. So I remember like having a conversation with my coach and that was the first like time I had spoken up about like feeling that way. Cause in the past, like I would be scared to go to an event, but gymnastics culture, like doesn't really matter if you're scared, like you got to do it. That's part of our sport. But having like an actual breakdown about something that was happening like eight hours later in the day is just not normal so I was able to have a conversation with my coach and he was like thank you for bringing that up to me like you don't have to do it we'll learn something else and having a positive response really like opened my eyes to that um especially like gymnastics wise I kind of learned like you should speak up for yourself um and I'm really lucky that my experience in club gymnastics is a lot more positive than others um so I like had a healthy relationship with my coaches but kind of moving into like more of the deeper mental health like concerns and illnesses um my first semester of senior year so like October 2019 was argue like a hundred percent the most pain I felt like I lost a friend to suicide on October 1st 2019 and it was someone that no one would ever like suspect it it was like it was crazy. Like, I remember coming to school that day and people were just, the bell had rung. I was like almost late to school and everyone was still like in the parking lot, just standing there. And I'm like, why are people not going to school? Like going to class, whatever. And my friend's like crying. And I like went up to her and I was hugging her. I was like, what's wrong? I was like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I remember her going, it is not going to be okay. And I was like, what happened? And she was like, Dustin died. And I was like, what and that was just that was insane like I was home alone my parents were visiting my brother in Paris like he was abroad so I was literally like home alone and I had friends stay over like we I'd like skipped I think like two practices told my coaches I was like I cannot come in so this was like the second suicide my school has ever had and it was like It was someone who was very popular. Like, he was on the soccer team. He was, like, he would go to, like, the after-school functions. He was, he was very popular. He was dating someone who was a junior, so he was close to the junior class. Like, it, it took our school, like, it, it hit us hard. So, no one really went to classes the rest of the week. We had the funeral the following weekend. Like, it was just, it was heavy. Um, and that was, like... That was just, that opened my eyes to mental health and student athletes because his sister plays D1 at UCSD. He was, we would bond over him going to recruiting trips because I was committed by then and he would be like traveling to Yale. He took a visit to UCSD and like all this stuff. And I was like, you had such a bright future and you took your own life. And that was so scary to me because in gymnastics, like it's not normal, but like, it was normalized to be, like, driving to practice and being, like, hmm, what if someone hit you with your car right now? Like, it was bad for a long time for a lot of people on my team when we had, like, before a coaching change, it was, like, really, really bad. People would be hiding upstairs before a warm-up, sitting under a table because they didn't want to come downstairs. People were hiding in the bathrooms because they didn't want to come downstairs. People were having mental breakdowns during warm-up because they were scared of our coaches. So it was just really, really heavy. And then when this happened, it was just like a moment where I was like, holy crap, like this is so real. And it was something that happened to someone I would never have suspected. So it was just such a moment for me. So from then on, I was just like a very big advocate. And thankfully, like a lot of my classmates were too for mental health. So in high school from then on, it was like so normalized to talk about what how you're feeling and stuff. And in club gymnastics, my teammates and I were really, really close where we'd always talk about it. Um, so coming into college, I was just like very normalized with that. And then in November, when I seeked therapy for the first time, like everyone always says like it's a trial and error. And it really was for me until I found like someone I trusted and really bonded with. Um, 
And then from then on, I've just absolutely loved that route and those resources that we have here. Well, I'm sorry it took that experience for you to to get there. I honestly had no clue about yeah. that at all. Um, and it's it's hard to even like I, like talk what are you supposed it. to say yeah, yeah. back to that? No, not talk about it. It's just like how do you reply to that? You know. Um, yeah. But it's it, it's it's sad that it takes such consequences for changes to actually take place. Yeah. But in a way, it's like, well, it, it, it sort of shapes you, right? It like, it, it's not that, like, you don't ever want that thing to happen. You don't ever want your Achilles to be torn twice. You don't yeah. ever want to have ankle surgery twice. But it's those little things that shape you into who you are today. Definitely. Um, and I'm not going to say, like, well, if that had to happen for you to be who you are today, then so be it. Because, no, not with that. Mm-hmm. But I do think that, I mean, it... it it has shaped you, obviously, and to being so open about it today. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has had a huge impact on, on so many other people. Having experienced that and seen it in other people, how did that impact your own mental health journey? Because, again, something I've read in articles, something we've talked about before, is even just coming in with an imposter syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I was reading an article from when you committed or like not even committed because I was freshman year it was your junior year or something like Mm -hmm. that of high school and you were like I was honestly surprised that I even got the offer because of the other girls in the class you've talked about how you guys were literally the number one recruiting class in the nation how good everybody was uh and now you joke around that out of the six there's only two (laughs) left um so there's that imposter syndrome already the two seasons are gone Haas happens you first time doing a therapy but you have these experiences that have shaped you in the past. So how did that impact your mental health journey? Yeah, I think it's it's given me a voice. Like, being able to speak about this and help others is definitely just, like, it's everything is worth it when I'm able to do that. Like, if someone comes to me and be, is like, I'm having a panic attack right now, like, what do I do? And I'm able to help them and, like, talk them through it. Um either help them find resources or even be that resource for them is just absolutely worth it and it it's something that I never thought I would be able to do like mental health especially like in high school when all this went down like it was so hard for me to talk about it for at least like a good year like I can't that first year like I would not be able to say Dustin's name without like like just like cringing because I'm like that was just so much emotion and sadness um so being able to just speak about it and um yeah like advocate for others being an ear for others is something I never thought would happen and with my own mental health journey um being able to see the growth I think is something that's really important and in the moment like I didn't think I would ever be able to do that and now what it's three years out from that incident and I'm able to talk about it reflect on it and be able to make change on it is something that is absolutely amazing you mentioned like being able to help others with panic attacks and I've Mm -hmm. never experienced that but I have had teammates that have gone through panic attacks Mm -hmm. being a teammate what could I do to help somebody going through that in that moment? Like, what, how, how do you even start or how do you help somebody going through that? What can you do? Yeah, so actually, shout out Jam because he's going through a mental health literacy program. So that's one of the modules because that's something I really wanted to learn is how can I help someone else in that situation? So, like, the first step is always, like, showing empathy and all of that. But also, like, you want to ground that person, like, whether it's, feel where your feet are, like close your eyes, do deep breaths and either like muscle contraction. So like squeezing as hard as you can and then releasing, just like letting some stress go and getting your heart rate down is always the first step. And then from there trying to figure out like, did this, was this your first panic attack? Did something trigger this? Like um, kind of getting down to the root of the problem. Cause in the moment, like speaking is, is a lot and it's going to be painful and, like, hard to get all that emotion out. But in the long run, like, having that out in the open is very helpful. But initiating that, um, that, I guess, trust between each other is also really, really important. And that confidentiality that I think a lot of people are scared of. 
Um, and that is a big stigma of mental health is being that vulnerable with someone. Um, but yeah, I think the first step always is to get your heart rate down and just like take a deep breath and know that you are okay and you are in a safe place is the first step. What do you say that overall this entire story of how of what has shaped you to being this advocate today Mm -hmm. like your biggest lesson is just the vulnerability a hundred percent like and I think that's something that our culture uh, the culture on our team really fosters is vulnerability like that is what makes us so close and really a family like I would do anything for the 15 girls on my team and I know they would do the same for me and it comes from vulnerability and that's where it really you get down to the nitty gritty of what makes you you. And that I think is one of the biggest strengths, especially on our team. And and I've definitely noticed that, obviously. I mean, I've had other of your teammates on, or I mean, mm-hmm. alumni now, which is kind of sad <laughs> to say, but um, I've had them on here and I really admire your team culture. It's one of my favorite things about your team. Even before I met all of you, now I'm like friends with all of you, yeah. but like before that, like it was so admirable from afar. Um, but with all this mental health going through it, specifically a gymnastics team, and you already mm-hmm. mentioned it, like that you guys joke about it, but this is something I've also noticed just as a gym fan. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm not like super uh, nerdy on my gymnastics, but I've watched it for multiple years now, like whenever there's a big event going mm-hmm. on, right? And something that a lot of people can tell is the mental health behind it. Not only am I talking Olympians, I'm talking before that like that elementary school training and all of that like how do you think that shapes the entire women's gymnastics culture because I feel like it's just a common trend at this point and before Simone even spoke up about it it was like I I feel like it wasn't really talked about yeah a hundred percent like I think it definitely comes from injuries and like being seen as weak like our bodies hurt constantly so there's a fine line of pushing through and being mentally tough but also what is too far like I think most coaches are always like if something hurts tell me but also there are some negative experiences with that is if you tell a coach and they're like like too bad like you have to still vault so, and then they'll get mad at you, like, and if you tell them, they'll get mad and go, okay, good condition. So there's always that negative connotation. So it kind of, like, silences the gymnast of speaking up. And I think every single gymnast has gone through that. Um, so it's kind of become the culture of not speaking up for what you're feeling. And especially, like, we're very much so in tune with our bodies. But even if we're feeling pain, we kind of just suck it up. And that usually does not work out well for us. So it either takes a bad experience for you to figure that out or um, you're lucky enough where the culture has changed within your team or program where you're allowed to speak up and advocate for yourself. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely those injuries and the toll your body takes because, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's different to any other sport. I really can't think of a sport that takes as much impact as women's gymnastics besides possibly football or rugby Mm -hmm. um but it's not even like the that's like just impact from somebody else you guys just being like a contactless sport that impact you guys put on your body is ridiculous and i think it has to do too with like the training five hours a day like yeah the most i would ever train especially at that age was like two hours was like wow but five hours and, like, the social life and how that's uh-huh. affected and being injured and your body hurts and the expectations, the standards, everything. I think it's it, it's it's a bit sad in a way looking at it like, damn, like yeah. such a beautiful sport yeah. is causing this pain. With that being said, I think it has shaped you into who you are today and everything mm-hmm. you've done, which is definitely something I would love to talk about. This all happens in February, but we you, you already mentioned Jam. Um, you guys started a mental health group within SAC, which yeah. is a student athlete advisory committee, which we're both involved in <laughs> here at Cal, and you're involved in literally the entire thing. Um, so how did that start? Where did that come from? I know you guys, 
you, did you meet Jem at the San Francisco thing, or how did no. you guys meet? Yeah. So, when did this start? Um, I believe we launched it officially in January 2022, I believe. Yeah. January 2022. Yes, 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 it was this year. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. The, no, that's that's absolutely crazy. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, so I always wanted to create, a, like, a peer-to-peer thing, like, ever since, ever since, like, the stuff I've been through, I was like, this should be a thing, like, because therapy is so hard to get yourself to go to, like, even mental health advocates, like, it was so hard for me to go to see a like actual licensed therapist so I was like okay maybe this could be a great first step so I went to Dr. Greg Chow our mental health performance uh coach and he was like this is a great idea but I'm probably not the person you go to I was like okay so who do I go to spoke to Jesse um and she was like okay let's like maybe pilot this through SAC and she and then like two weeks later she was like I actually have someone on football who has the same exact idea super passionate about it so Jam reached out to me and he was like, this is great. Like we should definitely pilot it through SAC. So that was also crazy how I only joined SAC in January. That's insane. So Jam and I joined SAC January, 2022, joined the mental health and wellness subcommittee, um, were chairs actually of the mental health and wellness subcommittee. That was the new, that was the first time it, the subcommittee actually became a thing. So we were the chairs of that and finally started peer-to-peer. So peer-to-peer meets bi-weekly um, whenever there's a SAC meeting and um, usually put on by the mental health and wellness subcommittee. You kind of sit in, it's like run like an AA meeting. That's how we always describe it. Like you just sit in a circle, totally confidential. Like it is 100% a safe space and you just share like how you're doing, good or bad. We're just all there to support each other, and it truly does make a difference to speak and put into words how you're feeling, because for me, like, I didn't know certain ways, like, certain feelings I was feeling until I was able to speak it into existence, and it was kind of just, like, a aha moment of, oh, wow, this is how I'm feeling, but it just created such a connection with different people that you probably would never have gotten that vulnerable with. And just seeing them at HBC or, like, walking around and just, like, flashing a smile, like, really did make a difference. And I know Jam and I, that's, like, our baby, and we absolutely loved it. Um, And then launching it for year two and having David and Noah kind of take that and run with it was just so cool to see it being passed down and having new people join and just... It was just such an amazing moment, and I will never forget that first peer-to-peer session. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like a club, even at this point, like what you were mentioning, just like you know the group at this Mm -hmm. point. And it's open to everyone, like if any Cal student athletes are watching this, um, it's open to literally everyone, but there's like the same five, six, seven people that are there all the time, and it's cool to like interact with them you know I think that's well I don't think that's one of the ways we got closer yeah. that's how I met Jam uh-huh. um that's how I met a lot of people in that probably. group I mean gymnastics <laughs> yeah. as well um but but yeah that, that was so cool to just experience and like being open to it yeah. um at least for me like I'm not one that speaks much there but the listening mm-hmm. just helps me so much like I talk I talk about this a lot with Cameron Rogers like um uh, my good friend Cameron Rogers <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really messing. Um, no, we talk about this a lot because she's also there, and I'm I'm just like just listening for me helps me a lot. Yeah. And I mean, she has helped me to like if I ever need to speak up or if I ne- ever need to talk, like I can do it, and mm-hmm. I know that. But just listening, at least for me, is I don't know. It's therapeutic yeah. in a way, and some people enjoy talking more. Some people enjoy listening, and mm-hmm. I think there's a beauty to that, and just like. Having that safe space, like you were saying, since it's the same people, it's almost like it's us keeping up with the diaries in a way. Like, (laughs) we've been going at it for 11 months now, Mm -hmm. and, like, some people were updating us last time on their accomplishments, and it's like, wow, that's so awesome that, like, we've experienced this entire journey with you, and Mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful to see that. 
um, and, and how much it's grown. And it's continuing to grow. I mean, yeah. you were mentioning that other schools are doing it now as well. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so this kind of like peer-to-peer and Cal SAC really just became a catalyst for my involvement in so many different things within the Pac-12 and NCAA. So Jam and I were able to go to the Pac-12 SAC conference in April of 2022, and that was the first time I've ever been, ever experienced anything like that. And Jam and I were still like relatively new to Cal SAC, so probably a little, it was very intimidating for us, but um, it's a conference for about two to three days. You do um, some roundtabling about different initiatives that your your own SAC is doing. You do community service and all that stuff. But during the share outs, Jam and I, in April 2022, um, I think it was like one or two weekends after the passing of Katie Myers on Stanford women's soccer. And that was that took like the nation by storm, obviously. And so mental health was a big conversation of topic at the roundtable. And luckily, Jim and I being the mental health and wellness chairs had a lot to speak on this. And we shared our peer to peer and how we run it, what it's done for the Cal athletics community. And I just went back to another SAC conference put on by the Pac-12 last weekend, like two days ago. Um, And one of the girls from ASU actually brought back this peer-to-peer idea to their SAC and now run a peer-to-peer hotline. And it's a little different from what Jam and I um, initially did, but she called it peer-to-peer and it's like the same idea. And it was just super cool to see this idea not just grow within Cal SAC, but now being brought to other schools. And it's just, it's it's really, it's really cool to see this idea grow. Yeah, obviously, like, that's amazing. And that's the point of denting, I guess, uh-huh. right? Like, it's, like, inspiring other people to do the same. And I think when I read that yesterday, like, in the chat, or I yeah. think, um, yeah, you know, you were talking about this, uh-huh. and Jam was also talking about this, and it's, like, that's incredible to see that, that was created right. out of this. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Um, and you mentioned your involvement with a lot of more things. How did you sneak <laughs> your way into all of this? Like, how are you representing Pac-12 SAC at Great D1 SAC question. now? Like, how, how does this work? Great question. So it all started from that April conference, Pac-12 SAC conference. Um, I was the youngest, the smallest person. Like, it is a room full of D1 athletes football players, volleyball players, baseball players. Like I was, I looked like I was 12 years old next to all of these people. And, um, with the support of jam, like I, I'm so passionate about this cause for mental health and, um, just growing the literacy of mental health for everyone that I had no problem speaking up in front of a room of PAC 12, like, um, directors and all these other student athletes. And, that's when I kind of had a switch of like a uh, like flip of a switch where I was like okay like I have a voice and people listen and I can make a change and that really just set me off and I think two months later I got an email from the director of Pac-12 student athlete engagement and she was like hey division one SAC NCAA division one SAC is looking for a Pac-12 rep So send in your resume, cover letter, like all this stuff. And I was like, okay, like I was in, I remember I was in Manchester and I had jet lag. So I was like, I'll just do it now. (laughs) So sent in all that stuff. A couple weeks later got, okay, you made it to the final round. We're sending you and another applicant to the NCAA to get reviewed. I was like, perfect. Like a month goes by. I was like, shoot, I didn't get it. Okay, whatever. And then like, I totally forgot about this because it was just so long. And they're like, oh, my God, you've been selected. I was like, no way. And at the time, I just had no idea the extent of what this, like, position was. Um, So for D1 SAC, I'm the sole Pac-12 representative. And out of all the – when they have, like, the D1 SAC conventions and council meetings, like, each of the 32 conferences sends a rep, so I go and I advocate for change for the Pac-12 as a conference, and I stay up to date on new um, initiatives that the NCAA wants to push forward, like the new transfer models and um, those windows. Like I was able to have a stay and be updated on that and bring it back to the Pac, so that was super cool. And since 
my position on D1 SAC is like it oversees a lot. They put me on Pac-12 SALT, so the student athlete leadership team. I wasn't going to apply for it because I was like, okay, I, I don't need to be involved in that much. But it is really helpful that I, I get to see like the policy base of Pac-12 SALT. So I'm in Cal SAC, Pac-12 SALT, and Division I SAC. So it's been really cool to see the difference in all of these because I think with Cal SAC, it's so much student athlete engagement and student athlete voice. Pac-12 SALT is so policy-based. Like the council meeting that you've been to is you're sitting with ADs, SWAs, FARs, Pac-12 commissioner, and it's so, okay, how do we get from point A to point B, like legislative-wise? And then D1 SAC is a perfect in-between of both of those. We're advocating for change for student athletes, but also what is that going to look like from a policy base? And we're kind of meshing that together. So it's really cool to have like a foot in every single one of those. That's awesome. And yeah, like like you mentioned, like I have been to a few of those, but mm-hmm. I can't imagine like seeing the whole thing and how it works from that point of view. Like, because that meeting just that one weekend for me, like changed my life. Yeah. And the way I view sports, like literally exactly. changed everything. Exactly. Um, you just realize a lot of things <laughs> and how much of a business it is. But I think falling in love with that business and that side of things and the business administration best behind it is just incredible. Yeah. Um, and you were mentioning it last night, could definitely see you <laughs> doing something like that, but that's, that's awesome that you're, you're there and you get that experience and I mean, get to extend it, but it's, it's kind of cool, right? Like telling this story and having this conversation, like as of February 8th, you were not, <laughs> really a gymnast oh, with yeah. two torn Achilles after two ankle surgeries coming in and a rejection from from Haas. And now today it's like you started this peer-to-peer at Cal, which influenced another school in the Pac-12, and you're within Cal SAC and then Pac-12 Salt and now D1 SAC, which is like literally like one person per, com- per conference. Um, isn't that crazy? It's absolutely crazy and like, like isn't it actually crazy just to yeah. sit down and reflect on that it's like that was yeah. 11 months yeah and like it's timing i think is everything and the day after Haas rejection for me like i got a call saying that i'm supposed to go to new york for like this event and i was like what what are the odds like this is like for investment banking and i just got rejected from like business school and i'm like like what is this so like Timing is really everything and, like, kind of embracing that journey and that hardship. And, like, it's just, like, like the quote you from what really, like, got us, like... Yeah, what got uh-huh. us going. I have that written down, yeah, like, I because I remember that night specifically because uh-huh. I have two takeaways from that night. So, context for everyone. Um, when we started with CalSAC... Um, the leadership team was leaving. Like, mm-hmm. there was going to be a new, new, new completely thing. Uh-huh. And I didn't really know you at this time. Yeah. I remember that. So I was very close with Jesse, obviously, because mm-hmm. I was involved in, like, literally Everything. every single <laughs> engagement uh, engagement group. Um, and I was just like, well, what is this sack thing? Like, I didn't even understand it back mm-hmm. then. And she's like, well, we're looking at this like you should apply. And I'm like... Well, is it, like, president or vice president? Like, I don't see myself doing anything else, but uh-huh. I don't know how seriously. And she's like, uh, I don't know. Maybe try uh, try vice president, and if you stay, you can do president leader. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I go. So she put you right up against me. <laughs> no, but I didn't, I didn't know at all, right? And that this is what I'm getting to. So I'm like, all right, VP, whatever. And I show up, and it's like, at least beyond. And I'm like, oh, why, why do we have to go against each other? I know. Like, I like but here's my takeaway, though. Here's my takeaway. I completely remember this, and I wrote it down in my notes, and it was like that night where we had to get up and present, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm also very competitive, so like yeah. the same way you are. Um, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> if, in case that isn't obvious. And I was like, oh, I'm going to give it my best. I prepared. I had this whole speech ready. Done. Mm-hmm. And then you got to present it. Done. First time ever. So there's two German words. I'm going to explain right the first one is schadenfreude okay. or schadenfreude um which is taking joy in the misery of someone else so when mm-hmm. somebody screws up somebody messes up you're happy about that mm-hmm. that i learned a few years ago and i'm like no that's clearly not what happened yeah. like we both did well yeah but i felt joy 
competing against you. Like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm, I want to beat her. I literally uh-huh. said, like, I told Jesse, like, even if I don't get it, like, I'm going to stay on here and that's fine. Uh-huh. Like, I want at least to be on it. That, that's fine. Uh-huh. And the word that's an antonym to that is fraud and fraud which is the complete opposite. It's taking joy in somebody else's success. And that's mm-hmm. what I learned that night. Like, and you obviously, like, I've never told you this. Yeah. You didn't tell it to me specifically. It was just an action. Like, we were there that night, and I presented, you presented. We were going against each other. Uh-huh. But I genuinely told Jesse, like, even if I don't get it, I want at least to be on it. Because seeing, like, good intentions up there and that good competition for something greater than us, uh-huh. I was like... I'm taking joy in somebody else's success, success, which is the first part to that night. Uh-huh. The second part is there was peer-to-peer that night, mm-hmm. and that's how we became friends. Yeah. It was that same night, which was crazy because you taught me that without even knowing yeah. it. And I taught uh-huh. you this quote, which is what I, what we were telling, uh, which uh, what I was talking about right now, um, which is the Marcus Aurelius quote, mm-hmm. the impediment to action advances action, and whatever stands in the way becomes the way. And that's clearly what you've done right yeah. like the obstacle became the way two surgeries the Haas thing and now transformed it into this like taking pain from mental health doing something about it mm-hmm. creating advocacy for that um not being able to compete as a gy- gymnast becoming a leader for your team like little things like that and i mean obviously the whole sack thing which we also just reviewed like you can't really be that student athlete you imagined but you became something which, in my opinion, is so much more valuable. Like, And that's very similar to my story, too. Yeah. Like, I didn't really compete as much throughout my career, or at least up until right now, I haven't as much. Um, but it's like trying to make the best with, with what you have, and that's clearly what happened. But I definitely wanted to, get, to <laughs> tell you that. And I remember specifically, too, um, Obviously, now that we've pretty much completed an episode, I'll uh-huh. tell you, you messed around a lot with me about being on, <laughs> on this, um, and we're friends, so I was, like, messing uh, around with you on that, but from that, I was like, I'm not telling her about uh, Freud and Freud until That's we're on the funny. episode, so full circle moment right here. Oh, my right gosh. Here. Ugh, love that. And spoiler alert, uh, Fair did win VP, but that's besides the point. I never... Whatever. See, <laughs> see I, ne- I never... I, I never gave you shit about that either. I know. Like, I... Because I genuinely was, like... My, the best thing was, one, how close it was. Mm-hmm. And that was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy how close it uh-huh. was. I was like, I should have blown her out. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, but but Jesse is like, what do you think about like both of you being on it? I'm like, uh-huh. yes, obviously. But like, let's do it. Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad he got to work out. I think it's what the right thing to do. Uh, I'm still concerned about how close that was, but hey, yeah. there was a clear winner. And I mean, whatever. Yeah, it's just like such a joke because like David and Noah were like, what do you do on sack? And I was like, I don't really know. He was like, what is your role? I was like. I don't really know. <laughs> They're like, they just made it up for you. <laughs> to to be fair, I mean, did I win VP? Yes. Yes. But you, you're on salt. You're on D1 sack. Afterwards, it's like, dude, you're way so more funny. involved in it at this point, um, which is awesome to see. So congratulations <laughs> on, on all of that. Um, let's see. Last few things. Yes. So, so I had written, written down from that question of the first surgery taught you grit Mm -hmm. you've been through four surgeries now um what keeps you going at this point like it's so easy to just be done call it it is so easy to do that (laughs) why keep going (sighs) that is a great question (laughs) and honestly like i i'm not lying when i tell you i think about that every single game every single day because At one point during the second, like, Achilles surgery, I could not stand to be in the gym. Like, one day, I was sitting there doing my rehab, and I, like, looked around, and every single person was doing gymnastics. Whether they were coming back from an injury and they were, like, doing basics on beam or something, everyone was at least, like, upside down. And I was just sitting there in pain, unable to do anything. And I remember I was like, 
I, I cannot sit in here. I was just like crying and crying. And I come in the next gym the next day, getting treatment and just putting my head in my arms and just crying. Cause I, I felt like I was on the team. I was in it cause I was doing rehab every single day. And it was just painful. Like BFR is the worst thing ever. And I was like doing that every single day. But I just could not picture myself doing gymnastics again, truly. I was like, why am I doing this? And I called Liz that night, and I was like, I cannot come in the gym tomorrow. Like, I physically cannot get myself. She's like, take a day. Take as long as you need. Like, rest up. And I was like, okay. I took the day. Talked to my roommates, like, the people in my class about it. And I was like, what do I do? And they're like, you have to at least try. And I was like, why? And they were like, no, like, you've put way too much time in this to just not even try. And I was like, okay, you are, like, 100% right. So was able to, like, come back, rehab, all that. And once you, like, start doing it again, like, the grind is so real. And it's something you miss. Like, I could not move a muscle after trying bars for after how many months. And... It's like, it's kind of addictive. Like you get in it and you feel that soreness and you're like, okay, progress is being made. I need to do it again. And it's, you, you get hooked. And now I'm like, I, now I'm coming back on bars and beam and I'm like doing more. And I'm like, okay, so like, I need to get to the point where I'm doing a beam routine now. Like I'm not stopping until I can do a beam routine. Cause you've gone through this. How many times, how many times have you had to ice bath and do all this stuff because you were just in so much soreness pain? But that's like, that's the pain that you miss. And that's definitely what keeps me going. And I've put my whole life into this and I only have like what now a year and a half left until it's truly, truly over. And this is something that I talked about in my senior speech, actually, at Airborne, um, College gymnastics is this glorified thing where it's, like, easier. And it's 100% not, but I don't know why. But when you're a club gymnast, you think it's easier. So ever since you're, like, a level 10, you're like, okay, only four more years until college gymnastics. Only three more years. Only two more years. But soon it really does turn into only one more year I get to do this. Only six more months I get to do this. And it's, like, you only have so much time to be a student athlete to be a high level performing athlete and you do want to make the most of that time and I think that's what I'm experiencing right now awesome yeah uh, <laughs> after these two and a half years mm -hmm. what does handle harder better mean to you that is a great question um handle hard better I think that is adapting to everything that is thrown at you. Like, coming in freshman year, I was having imposter syndrome, but to the point where I came from, like, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, I knew I was, like, academically strong, but I felt like I wasn't smart enough to be considered a student. I wasn't good enough to be considered an athlete. So let alone being a student athlete and combining those, I was like, what in the world am I doing here? And then everything happening and I had to pivot and adapt and kind of realize I'm more than a student athlete. And that's really, I think, what being a student athlete is, is learning that you are so much more than that. So that's why I think I was having those identity crises when I got hurt, no longer an athlete. When I didn't get into Haas, mm, not good enough student. But what am I more than that? And that's when I was like, okay, you're in Cal SAC, SALT, D1 SAC. You're doing all these like internships, career development, traveling to different things and doing all those different opportunities. And I think that's what Handle Hard Better is, is once you get into that tough place, how are you getting out of it? But not only that, how are you going to grow from it and push from that? And just learn more about yourself and what you really are capable of. To complement that awesome answer, what is your definition of success? Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, I think for the longest time it was being 
that stereotypical successful, like putting up a LinkedIn post, like, hey, I got an internship and being able to post like your nine nine routine or whatever. But now I think it's being a hundred percent satisfied of where you are at. And satisfied meaning this is I like I love the place I'm at right now, but also like what is there else I can do? And being satisfied of knowing that you are doing the best you can, but also you know you can do better and you can do more. So, like, let's say for next summer, like, technically I already have an internship secured, but I I want to also get something else. Like, I want to see if I can be better than what I already have. And I think that success is having that drive to even push yourself even when your cap is reached because it really isn't. And knowing that, but also being okay if, okay, what if I don't find another internship? So what? You've already done a lot, and being satisfied with that, I think, is a big part of me, and I think the student-athlete identity also. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Was that this one? Yep. That was perfect timing. That was perfect timing. Let me see. Back. We're back. (laughs) But yeah. Um, Yeah, hopefully you caught it that entire thing (laughs) um but regardless is there anything i missed anything else you want to touch on um i don't think so if i'm being uh actually maybe um i think mentorship is a big part of our identity and honestly like our relationship like i like especially through like the teaching of like the class like you've become such a mentor of me and I think I've learned that a good mentorship is learning from both directions and I think that's what our relationship is really like found like founded upon like I learned so much from you and now I've learned you learned stuff from me which is cool but I think that's something that is really special and that's why I like wanted to be a mentor for these student athletes is we learn a lot from them about how they think and their lived experiences and stuff but it's also like a two-way street and I think that's the whole point of denting and what you're doing and it's just absolutely amazing and I applaud you thank you um yeah I mean I was talking about this with my Haas mentor actually Mm -hmm. who I've known forever now uh I'm friends with his son because he became one of my teammates Mm -hmm. um but we were just talking about this and I wrote a blog um, about him mm-hmm. uh, for our team account because everybody knows him on, on our team and he just reply, replied like I hope you know that what you've learned from me I've learned from you as well and I think it's the same thing with uh, UGBA 199 mentorship mm-hmm. right like people think like oh we're teaching them but in reality you get to know so much yeah. more through them without even realizing same as teaching or anything um and it's the same way here right yeah. i wasn't going to give you that pride of knowing that you've taught me <laughs> things i'm kidding um obviously i was going to tell you at one point but yeah i mean i think that's the the beauty of it and in a way like the podcast in and of itself it's like an excuse for me to sit down and talk with people that i admire what mm-hmm. they're doing and everything yeah everything they're about but it's also like a school for me like it's something that allows me to learn so much from many different people and their stories and etc so yeah appreciate this appreciate we made this happen yeah really enjoyed it it's like one of the few times i've done like uh, a podcast with somebody i know um your best friend with my best friend (laughs) yeah there you go (laughs) self-proclaimed but i'll give it to you um Uh. but yeah that's that's pretty much it for today. Elise, thank you so much. I love doing this, and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. To everybody that watched on YouTube or listened on Spotify, thank you guys so much. That's it for today. I'll see you guys next time. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, and that'll be it for today. See ya. Bye. Nice. That's it. That's the experience for you. That was so fun. Oh, Wait, that was so fun. I miss that so much. I haven't recorded in... I don't know how long. Wait, that's crazy. That was so fun. Ugh. Such great questions, Sarah.